Okay, so um, thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks the PWI in particular uh, for giving us the opportunity to keep meeting like this and exchange ideas. Um, that's a really important part of our industry. Um, thanks to David and the team for, for setting this up, this, this session. And thanks to all of you lot for giving us the opportunity to explain a little bit about what we do to plan the future of the railway. So uh, I'm Adrian Bocking. This is Heather. Heather Pritchard, you probably spotted that. So uh, we're, we're proud to support the PWI. Um, the, one of the messages we'd like you to take from, from our session is that um, the future, the future we're all looking forward to seeing, uh, depends on track engineering. There used to be a slogan that uh, said, uh, Britain relies on rail. Well, Britain relies on rail, and rail relies on track engineers. So, um, we work in network rail. We're in a, uh, a group that's now called uh, Network Strategy, but will soon be called the System Operator. Um, and uh, from, from June of this year. So I'll come back to that a little bit later about what that means. The reason we're here is to talk about the future. It's the and beyond part of the seminar title. We've only got one slide. Um, <laughs> so, the future is uncertain. Uh, we know that much. And, uh, and I apologise for the graphics. It's all my own doing, my own mistakes. So, uh, so, um, so the quality of the slide isn't, isn't as up to what we've seen so far. So what we'd like to do is explain what the future means for the network, what the processes that we're undertaking are to help shape that future and bring stakeholders along with us, how that relates to the Northwest, and then how that relates to track engineers. So that's the, the cycle of our presentation. So it's, it's, worth, it's worth considering uh, who is involved in shaping the future of, of our railway. Um, and we've got, we've got quite a number of parties. Um, there, there's, a great, there's a great movement um, in political circles and in the industry for devolution. So what this means is making decision-making closer to, closer to the voters and closer to the passengers. Um, so, um, so as a result of devolution, we're starting to see a proliferation of stakeholders with a direct interest in the future of the railway. So we have a group that I call the train service specifiers. Um, until recently, that was almost exclusively the Department of Transport. But increasingly now, we're seeing um, the Welsh Government and uh, Transport Scotland uh, play a role in that as part of the national devolution. We have the establishment um, of sub-national transport bodies. Uh, transport for the North, we've, we've heard about earlier from John. Uh, we've also got Transport for West Midlands and uh, Transport for London is somewhere down south, I think. <coughs> we've got um, local authorities involved and, and uh, increasingly elected mayors. Now, these elected mayors are standing on a manifesto which says they are going to deliver particular things. Quite a lot of that is transport related because they can see how the constituents really want that. So this is bringing decision-making closer to the voters. We have local enterprise partnerships. Local enterprise partnerships are established to, in, to get industry and business involved in uh, decision-making about infrastructure investment and rail. And we've got the train operating companies and freight operating companies. Um, we've got 23 train operating companies across the network on heavy rail. We've got about seven freight operating companies, depending on how you count them. All of these have got an interest in what the future looks like from their perspective. So they've got their, their bottom line to improve, their services to deliver, their particular uh, customer groups. 
And within network rail, we have eight becoming nine routes. Um, so um, the north of England crosses two of them. Um, and the services that enter and leave the north of England cross several more. So all of this is leading us to conclude that as a, um, as a counterbalance to devolution, the forces of devolution, we need a strong system operator, um, which is a part of network rail in which, um, which Heather and I work. So what does the system operator do? Um, we have, network rail is granted a license by the Secretary of State to operate the network. Um, and license condition one includes uh, uh, an explicit obligation to plan the future of the railway. So we're required to do this by law. <coughs> to satisfy that requirement, we have a long-term planning process which looks out to 30-year horizons. <coughs> Quite a lot of the information about the long-term planning process and the, the reports from it are published on our website, so you can take a look at those. Um, so we've got, um, we're developing plans for the baseline here and now, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, out into the 40s. We get involved in uh, franchise specification because uh, many of the bidders are not clear about what the system is capable of. Uh, so we help them to reach sensible conclusions about what they might include in their, in their bids for franchise competitions. We also um, regulate, we apportion access for trains. So um, we have a process uh, called the sale of access rights where uh, any operator can make an application for, to use capacity. Um, and, then we, and then our sale of access right panel which sits within the system operator, looks to balance those competing uh, requirements across the network. And we also get involved in timetable development. So that's from early planning of timetable through to, um, through to the short-term timetable change. It's really important that we, that we remember that none of, none of the great work that we do actually releases any benefit until the trains train start to use it. <coughs> So, getting all of this right is fundamental to realising the benefits of investment in railways. All of the systems operators' activities is aimed at getting the best use from the railway, so uh, from the network. So, so best use is uh, quite an ambiguous term, and um, you can quite quickly see that there are competing forces, that, uh, so for example, um, local commuter services uh, competing against longer distance fast services, freight against, uh, against passenger services, and, and then um, more sort of um, uh, less obvious um, um, tensions, trade-offs between cost, performance and capacity. So that's a summary about what, <coughs> what the uh, system operator does. Um, as part of our long-term planning process, um, we have the North of England route study, um, which is the bit that brings it relevant to the North of England. Uh, and I'd like to ask Heather to take over from here. Thank you. Do you want me to do it? I'll, I'll see if I can work the clicker. Right. The North of England Route Study is a study um, that spans both LNW and LNE, and as Adrian described, it also crosses other boundaries as well as services pass beyond um, the North, going either towards Scotland or down towards London. So I'm leading from LNW's perspective, and Sue Cook is leading from LNE's perspective. So what is a route study? A route study is where we plan the future of rail, to develop and assess options for long-term use of the network out to 2043. So as Adrian said, we're looking at long-term planning um, out for 30, 40 years. So what do we actually believe we want or need um, for rail in the north of England? Really, I believe it's to address four strategic goals. The first being economic growth. The second being 
um, reduction in environmental impact. The third, improving quality of life, social inclusion. And the fourth is affordability and value for money. So these four goals are detailed uh, within our market studies, which are logged on our Network Rail website. And there are four key market studies, being the long distance market study, the regional urban market study, London southeast market study, and our freight market study. So these strategic goals that I mentioned are expressed as what we call conditional output, um, conditional based on value for money. So these conditional outputs could be journey times, looking at journey times along a particular corridor, and service frequencies. There could be about passenger capacity along a particular corridor, or freight capability for the next five-year control period and out to 2043. Moving forward, our traditional route study process is actually changing. Now, what this process will be called, we don't know. We haven't agreed. But we are in the process of um, developing this with our key stakeholders, so the Department for Transport, Transport for the North, Rail North, and the routes. So we've been discussing this with the Director of Route Asset Management and our track engineers, and agreeing with the um, stakeholders what this process should look like. Although the process is changing, <clears throat> the strategic goals remain unchanged. <coughs> so how can we accommodate growth in the north of England? So we have inputs and outputs for the route study. Some of the inputs are, first of all, system capabilities. So what is the existing system capability now? This will be in terms of number of trains per hour that can run along a corridor, journey times, frequency of services, safety, performance, and the capacity actually bums on seats on trains. How many people can actually fit on the, the current services that run along our corridors? We look at demand forecasts. So this is forecast the level of demand and the opportunity that higher levels of growth in an area may bring. And the market studies, as I've mentioned before, where they identify strategic goals for each sector over the medium and the long term. And it, it's actually understanding how we can deliver, how rail is best placed to deliver our conditional outputs for each market sector. Um, we're also using the integrated rail report, which may have been mentioned by John Cridland earlier. This is a transport for the north um, report that they're producing. And we're also using the northern powerhouse rail report. So we're making sure that we're using the same base evidence. If something's already been looked at in the north, we're going to use that information as part of our route study. We also look at economic scenarios. So what is the latest thinking on the economic front? And from a forecast and modelling perspective, what are the benefits that rail can bring? So we're also using the independent economic review that John Cridland mentioned earlier. Um, this is a Transport for the North document, and we're, we're making sure that we're using a consistent evidence base to inform this study. So we're not using one level of economic forecasting data and Transport for the North are using another. We're all using the same base evidence. So as part of this study, we're agreeing with our key stakeholders what our key strategic questions are. So what do we believe are our issues in the north of England from a rail perspective? Where are our problems? So we've held two workshops to date, and we're actually, we've asked our stakeholders to tell us what they think their key strategic questions and problems are. So we've asked the Department for Transport, our DRAMs, um, TFN and Rail North. And we're going to agree what these strategic questions are and also how we prioritise those. And then we're going to put a programme together to answer those. So these are all based around meeting predicted growth across CP6 and beyond, but also focusing on customer benefits and service improvements. It's an inclusive process, so it's, it's not a network rail study where we've sat in a silo and come out two years later with this is what we think the world looks like in 2043. We've actually engaged with all our stakeholders and come up with some example questions. So here's a few of the example questions. So how can rail travel across Liverpool or Manchester be enhanced? What's the capacity and capability does rail need to provide 
in order to support economic, social and environmental objectives of Preston, Liverpool. And another strategic question may be, what interventions are required to meet future growth along a particular corridor out to 2023, 2033 and 2043? So we're looking at the short, medium and long-term goals within the study. So now we're looking at the outputs. So we're in the process of finalising, agreeing the strategic questions, prioritising them and agreeing which remits need to take priority. Um, again, these are all agreed with our stakeholders and we're going to create what I've called ninja teams, but they are supposed to be called sub-teams. And within a sub-team, there, there will be a person from each of the capability analysis teams, economic analysis, engineers, people from the route, Transport for North, etc., the right people in the room to address and answer that strategic question. So, our first milestone um, for which we need to answer our strategic questions is by the autumn statement in 2017. So, we have a number of strategic questions we've identified we need to address as a priority that we will have reports produced in advance of autumn 17. We will also provide a list of the prioritised questions that we've listed with their level of maturity um, and an ongoing milestone to show this is what we're going to deliver and by when. So this is a modular, continuous planning process. So what sort of outputs can we um, expect to see coming out of the route study? We'll see things with regard to future services, so either an increase in capacity, more trains along particular corridors, or greater capacity on the train. So to meet demand, we may we either need to run more trains or run longer trains. Oh, sorry, I'll go back one. We need to look at whole system solutions. So how can we deliver faster, better services to accommodate growth in the north of England? We could develop options for journey time improvements along corridors um, for passengers and freight. Or we could re-signal along a corridor to allow more trains to run through. Or we could look at reducing carbon emissions by electrifying a route potentially. This then will give us a suite of investment options and choices for funders as an output from the route study. So all of the outputs are evidence-based. And their choice is available to funders to actually determine the long-term use and development of the network. So how does this all relate to track engineering? We believe it comes in two forms. Um, looking at future work banks, we've discussed with the Director of Route Asset Manager um, and our track engineers with regard to what renewal plans do you have? How can we look at outputs or inputs to our route study? Have you got any a campaign of plane line renewals on a particular corridor where we may be looking to improve journey times. Can we actually merge these together and actually deliver them as one package of work? Are there any, is there a potential to look at re-signalling as well along a corridor? Also, sorry. Also, we'll be looking at future enhancement schemes that may come out of the route study, future options, choices for funders. Some possible examples of this um, at the Cumbrian coast, looking at the Cumbrian coast, we've mentioned resilience a number of times, um, but we know, we know that at the moment there's a proposed infrastructure improvement um, project on the Cumbrian coast to energise and have a nuclear coast. And also, one of the future phases of the Cumbrian coast is to actually improve the infrastructure and also improve services along that corridor. High Speed 2, we've mentioned High Speed 2 a number of times. So we're working closely with our stakeholders to understand the best potential use and opportunities that HS2 can bring. So this could be connecting communities to HS2. It could be identifying options where we may change existing service patterns um, and also aligning HS2 works with works from the route study and also work that the route may have in a particular area may look at stations where we may, we may believe we have capacity issues um, in the short, medium and long term. Propose freight developments across the north of England, um, for instance, northern ports. Development of the Transpennine Corridor and all the schemes that may 
um, may be in place over the Trans Pennine Corridor. And also understanding the needs of the northern cities, as we've mentioned about Northern Powerhouse Rail. I think it's also important that we have a good understanding of the track engineering capabilities. Through developing the strategic questions, we look to identify where our problems are in the north of England from a rail perspective, not just head straight to a, a, a solution. I find it quite difficult, to be fair. Being a track engineer myself, I'll sit in a room and they'll mention a, a particular strategic problem and I'll go straight to, you could four-track that or you could have a grade separated junction. But actually, we need to understand the problems and through the process of the route study, we'll come out with choices for funders. So how can we deliver track engineering solutions and understand what the track system is capable of delivering to actually deliver these outputs that we're talking about. So we're looking for the track engineering community to build on its tremendous success over the past decade um, and achieve a lot more from the track engineering system and help us understand how we can plan for the future. We mentioned earlier about some initiatives abroad that we could possibly bring into the route study, looking at a corridor, are there any innovative solutions that we can draw into the route study process? Here are a couple of examples. Um, I think I'm behind with my clicker. I'm really sorry I'm paying no attention to what's going on behind me. Look who I am. Right. So, for instance, could we have 125 mile an hour turnouts or faster? Question. I think at the moment we're restricted to NR60H as 100 mile an hour fastest turnout. Please, please uh, don't shoot me down if I'm wrong. And I think we're restricted to an F switch from a vertical perspective. Although I know there's some innovations in place to actually look at how we can improve speeds and develop, um, develop options. But maybe we can look at higher speeds as part of, of um, this route study process. Reduced asset downtime. So, the actual time available to maintain the infrastructure, one, of the, one issue that was raised at a recent workshop was about, well, actually, we only get a three-hour window to actually maintain our infrastructure because you're wanting to run more trains. So, by running more trains, you're actually tightening our window. What can we do to work together to try and improve that? Um, about improving asset reliability as well um, and resilience, I think... Improving asset reliability, we've made great um, progress with regards to broken rail reductions, etc. But what else can we do in that field? How can we work together? Resilience, we've mentioned um, the Cumbrian coast and inclement weather and, and flooding. I know last year in Carlisle, um, we had issues um, with flooding there. So what can we actually do to build resilience into the route study process while we're looking on a corridor by corridor basis? Sorry, I'm clicking again. So, um, improving track quality as well. So we need to understand how we can incorporate some of those things into our thinking. So, we are working with our stakeholders to understand the role that rail can play. Um, driving the economy, but also track engineering, as we've mentioned, is a really key integral part. Rail usage is more popular than ever. And there's an increase in passenger travel and freight demand, and this has all grown across the network since the mid-1990s. And this pattern is forecast to continue. So user benefits, what actually will we deliver out of this route study? What will the benefits be to the fair-paying passengers? There'll be an increase in capacity, so we will be running more trains on our infrastructure. Reduced times for passenger and freight, so quicker journey times, and reduced rail industry costs. So this will enable us, as an industry, to deliver our vision of a better railway for a better Britain. Thank you.